a production of the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. A. Walton Litz is the Holmes Professor of Literature at Princeton University. He received his B.A. from Princeton and his Ph.D. from Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He has also taught or lectured at other institutions, including Columbia University and the Breadloaf School of English. In 1973, he received the Danforth Foundation's Harbison Award for Distinguished Teaching. Professor Litz is the author of critical books on James Joyce, Jane Austen, and Wallace Stevens. And he has edited a collection of essays on T.S. Eliot, Eliot in His Time. The most recent works are editions of Ezra Pound's letters and of the poetry of William Carlos Williams. Thomas Stearns Eliot was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1888 and died in London, England in 1965. His ashes were buried as he had wished in the parish church in the little English village of East Coker, the home of Eliot's ancestors who pioneered into the new world in the 17th century. On the memorial tablet in the church in East Coker are inscribed the mottos that frame the poem of that name, the second of Eliot's four quartets, In My Beginning is My End, In My End is My Beginning. The poetic lives of Eliot and his friend Ezra Pound, about whom I'll have more to say later, would appear to follow a classic pattern of expatriation, a return to beginnings that come before the American experience. At the start of their careers, they felt keenly, like Henry James before them, the thinness and provinciality of American life. For a young American poet, the first years of this century were especially dispiriting. The generation after Whitman, after all, had produced no American poet of any great stature, no distinctive voice, and the anthologies of the turn of the century are filled with poems written in a weak, imitative style. Looking back at this period many years later, Eliot remembered the irrelevance of English poetry of that time, and then he added, there were no American poets at all. If we look at the verses that Eliot wrote around the age of 18, we see the lack of freshness, as in this imitation of Tennyson. The flowers I gave thee when the dew was trembling on the vine were withered ere the wild bee flew to suck the eglantine. Both Eliot and Pound came to feel that an escape from this kind of stylistic prison could not be accomplished unless they escaped from the American social and literary scene. Those contemporaries of Pound and Eliot who chose to remain in America and to create a Native American poetry often spoke of the expatriates as enemies, enemies of their own enterprise. This was especially true of William Carlos Williams, who felt that the academic nature of Eliot's early poetry threatened to stifle the more spontaneous American voice that he was cultivating, and who compensated, I think, for his own sense of belatedness, of isolation, by casting Eliot in the role of a cultural traitor. In book one of Williams' long poem, Patterson, he envies the men that ran and could run off toward the peripheries, leaving him and his companions to grapple with the job of finding a distinctive American idiom. The contest that Williams set up between an international style on the one hand and a Native American modernism on the other may have been necessary at that time when the young men were trying to find their own voices. But now from the perspective of over half a century, we can see that Pound and Eliot were in many ways just as American as Williams or Wallace Stevens, and that Williams and Stevens were just as international as Pound or Eliot. Pound makes this argument for Eliot's Americanness in a 1920 exchange with Williams, 
where he shrewdly turns the tables by saying that Williams is the newly arrived outsider who is objective enough to survive the American environment, while he and Eliot are so deeply infected with what he calls the American virus that they have to fight the disease day and night. While Pound remained to the very end a rambunctious American abroad, Eliot assimilated British culture until he became superficially an Englishman. He chose British citizenship in 1927, and it is said that he valued the order of merit conferred upon him by the Crown in 1948 more than he did the Nobel Prize of that year, probably because Henry James before him had also received the order of merit. But Eliot knew that he was, as he once said of James, everywhere a foreigner. And just as he believed that only an American can properly appreciate James, so no one can properly appreciate Eliot without understanding those deep attachments to the American landscape and the American past that are the imaginative sources of much of his writing and especially four quartets. Now let's pick up the story in 1914. In September 1914, Ezra Pound reported that an American called Eliot had visited him in London where Pound had been living since 1909. And soon after, Eliot sent Pound a poem called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Pound immediately shot off an excited letter to the editor of Poetry Magazine in Chicago. I was jolly well right about Eliot, he said. He has sent in the best poem I have yet had or seen from an American. He is the only American I know of who has made what I call accurate preparation for writing. He has actually trained himself and modernized himself on his own. It is such a comfort to meet a man and not have to tell him to wash his face, wipe his feet, and remember the date 1914 on the calendar. From 1914 until the publication of The Wasteland in 1922, a work pound called The Justification of Our Movement, Our Modern Experiment Since 1900, throughout that period, Eliot and Pound were essentially collaborators, and we'll come back to this in a moment. But first, we have to discover how Eliot modernized himself on his own. T.S. Eliot's grandfather, one of the founders of Washington University in St. Louis, moved to that city from Boston in the 1830s. He was a Unitarian minister, and the influence of Unitarianism, which has been described as Puritanism without theology, pervaded Eliot's childhood. His father was a successful local businessman, his mother a cultivated woman, who wrote a great deal of poetry. Although the family lived in the Midwest for over half a century, the ties with Boston and New England were strong. Summers were spent at Cape Ann, and this landscape had a lasting hold on Eliot's imagination. After schooling in St. Louis, he was sent east to Milton Academy and then Harvard University, where he received a BA in 1909. After a year of graduate study at Harvard in philosophy, Eliot spent a year in Paris, attending Bergson's lectures on philosophy and reading French poetry. In 1911, he returned to Harvard and continued graduate work in philosophy and Eastern religions. After completing coursework for a PhD in philosophy, he started a thesis on the English philosopher F.H. Bradley, which led him first to Germany and then with the war approaching to Merton College, Oxford, where Bradley was a fellow. During these formative years, the event that affected the course of Eliot's life was not a personal crisis, although he was often under severe psychological stress, but his discovery in December 1908 of Arthur Simmons's book, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, which led him to the works of the 19th century French poets, and especially Baudelaire and Jules Laforgue. Of all the French poets that Eliot encountered in Arthur Simmons's book, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, Jules Laforgue had by far the most profound influence upon him. And within a matter, within a matter of a few months, Eliot was writing an imitation of Laforgue, poetry with a distinctive voice, poetry which could have been written by no other poet at no other time. From Baudelaire, Eliot said that he learned of the possibility of fusion between the sordidly realistic and the phantasmagoric of how the apparently anti-poetic experience of the modern city could be turned into materials for poetry. From Laforgue, he learned to use irony to split the poet's personality, allowing the poet to be both a participant 
and a spectator, as in the you and I of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Simmons's book had an impact on Eliot like that of a deep personal experience or even a religious conversion. Within a very few months, he was writing poetry distinctively his own and distinctively modern. The little poem, Spleen, published in January of 1910, could have been written by no other poet at no other time. It sets the tone for most of the poems in Eliot's first volume, Prufrock and Other Observations, which was published in 1917, although this particular poem Eliot chose not to reprint. Just listen to it and you hear the voice and the tone of the early poems in Prufrock and Other Observations. Sunday, this satisfied procession of definite Sunday faces, bonnets, silk hats, and conscious graces, in repetition that displaces your mental self-possession by this unwarranted digression. Evening, lights, and tea, children and cats in the alley, dejection unable to rally against this dull conspiracy, and life a little bald and gray, languid, fastidious, and bland, weights, hat and gloves in hand, punctilious of tie and suit, somewhat impatient of delay on the doorstep of the absolute. Most of the poems in Eliot's first volume, such as The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, Portrait of a Lady, and La Filia Che Pianja, were written between 1909 and 1912. And they're marked by a freely cadenced verse, which can be a vehicle for confession, but is always controlled by a distancing irony. It's as if the 19th century dramatic monologue of Browning had been filtered through the sensibility of Henry James. The opening lines of Prufrock, I think, are typical. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Here the third line, with its scientific imagery, deflates our romantic expectations. And it's easy to understand why John Berryman said that with this line, modern poetry begins. The remaining poems in Prufrock and Other Observations were written after Eliot came under Pound's influence, and they have many affinities with the short satiric poems of Pound's writing at that time. But in the little poem, Cousin Nancy, we find something more, a special use of illusion that would become one of the leading characteristics of Eliot's poetry over the next few years. The first two movements of this short poem present an ironic portrait of a liberated new woman of whose modern attitudes are expressed in trivial actions. I'm going to read the first part of the poem, but not the last three lines. Miss Nancy Ellicott strode across the hills and broke them, rode across the hills and broke them, the barren New England hills riding to hounds over the cow pasture. Miss Nancy Ellicott smoked and danced all the modern dances, and her aunts were not quite sure how they felt about it, but they knew that it was modern. If the poem ended there, and there is a kind of closure, it would be simply a clever piece of social satire. But the last three lines exploded into a different dimension. Upon the glazen shelves kept watch, Matthew and Waldo, guardians of the faith, the army of unalterable law. Matthew and Waldo, as Cousin Nancy would flippantly refer to them, are of course Matthew Arnold and Ralph Waldo Emerson, defenders of an older order now safely locked away in a glazen bookcase. And the change of tone that comes with that last line, which has the ring of heroic poetry, that I think is the thing we notice most at the end of the poem. And if we recognize it as also the last line of George Meredith's Miltonic sonnet, Lucifer and Starlight, the irony of the poem is suddenly deepened. And Cousin Nancy's petty rebellion is juxtaposed ironically with classic treatments of Lucifer's grand defiance. Now, over the next few years, this elusive interweaving of past and present became not only the central method in Eliot's poetry, but the major theme of his literary criticism. And for the purpose of understanding Eliot's poetry of roughly 1917 to 22, I think we can seize upon two themes from his most famous essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. One is the need for an impersonal or objective poetry in which the life of the writer is dissolved into his art. And the second is the need to see past and present simultaneously. 
the two affecting each other in an endless and dynamic process, where, as Eliot says, the introduction of the new, the really new work of art alters the entire order of the literary tradition. Just to give a practical example, a reading of Joyce's Ulysses, according to Eliot, permanently changes our view of the Odyssey, while at the same time, Homer's classical model controls our understanding of the modern work. Most of the poems collected in Eliot's second volume, Poems 1920, are powerful expressions of what Eliot called the historical sense, the historical sense that involves a perception not only of the pastness of the past, but of its presence. He goes on to say that the historical sense compels a man to write not only with his own generation in his bones, but with a feeling that the whole of the literature of Europe, from Homer, and within it the whole of the literature of his own country, has a simultaneous existence and composes a simultaneous order. A few of the poems in Poems 1920 are written in French. These are partly, I think, a gesture toward internationalism, a rebuke of American provinciality, and partly an exercise in the language which had profoundly shaped Eliot's sensibility. In these French poems, he is often personal and confessional, as if the foreign language could replace the screen of irony. But the volume is dominated by other poems, poems written in English and cast in tight quatrains, a form which served a double purpose for Eliot. Both Eliot and Pound believe that the poet critic should, in his poetry through example, criticize and redirect the course of contemporary poetry. And around 1917, the two poets decided that a new direction was needed. As Pound remembered it years later, at a particular date, in a particular room, two authors, neither engaged in picking the other's pocket, decided that the dilatation of free verse, general floppiness, had gone too far, and that some countercurrent had to be set going. Their remedy was to adopt the quatrain form of the French poet Gautier, an impersonal and tight form well suited to the irony and satire that Pound would later use with great daring in Hugh Selwyn Moberly. In Eliot's quatrain poems, which dominate the volume Poems 1920, the transaction between past and present is usually conducted through a network of allusions like the one that ends Cousin Nancy. Burbank with a Bedecker, Bleistein with a cigar, for example, is almost entirely made up of allusions to the Venice of literature and of legend. In this poem and some of the others, the present day world often seems a sad falling off from the grandeur of the past. And the question asked in a cooking egg, where are the eagles and the trumpets, seems to demand the answer buried somewhere beneath our modern fragmentation. But in other poems, in Poems 1920, and especially in Sweeney Among the Nightingales, the transaction between past and present is much more complicated, and the present modifies our view of the heroic past as well as the past modifying the present. At the very end of Sweeney Among the Nightingales, we have a quatrain in which both past and present seem equally contaminated and sang within the bloody wood when Agamemnon cried aloud and let their liquid siftings fall to stain the stiff, dishonored shroud. Passages like this look forward very much to the wasteland, as does that first poem in Poems 1920, Garantian, which Eliot once thought of reprinting as a preface to the wasteland. In Garantian, the fully realized narrator of a traditional dramatic monologue has dwindled into nothing but a disembodied voice, a voice speaking of spiritual dryness and the futility of trying to interpret anything. And this poem, Garantian, leads directly into the surreal world of the wasteland, but its nervous, discontinuous structure also dramatizes the difficulties Eliot would have in organizing his first long poem. In early 1916, after the first months of his disastrous marriage to Vivian Hay Wood, and with the war growing more oppressive all about him, Eliot wrote to a friend that he had lived through material for a score of long poems in the last six months. Six years later, in The Wasteland, 
he would express his sense of personal and cultural loss in a poem which, like Joyce's Ulysses, became part of an age that cannot be understood without it. But before Eliot could write such a poem, he had to find an appropriate form, and that was not easy with suffering so near. From this perspective, we can see Eliot's strong emphasis in his criticism on tradition, on order, on impersonality, and the aloof tone of many of the quatrain poems as a defense, a defense against the deep feelings of disorder and anxiety that were finally absorbed into the wasteland. After all, by temperament, Eliot was a confessional poet in the Romantic tradition. And although his criticism often calls for classical restraint, he always believed, like the Romantics, that poetry comes from the unconscious. The poet cannot determine or even comprehend the origins of his inspiration and may, when first writing a poem, not even understand what he is saying. It is in the rewriting, in the search for form, that the conscious critical mind comes into play. Now, these notions are brought into sharp focus when we look at the manuscript of The Wasteland, which was thought lost for many years but rediscovered in the 1960s and published in 1971. Reaching back to at least 1914, to a poem called The Death of St. Narcissus, the fault starts in the Wasteland manuscript give us a record of Eliot's spiritual and psychological anguish during his early years in London. In late 1921, while recuperating from both a physical and a nervous breakdown, Eliot began work on his long poem in earnest, piecing together some of the earlier fragments and writing new passages, sometimes in an almost trance-like state. He then turned in late 1921 to Ezra Pound for the kind of friendly editorial help that Pound had given him with his earlier poems. And Pound's extensive cutting and revising of the Wasteland Manuscript gives him the dedication to the poem Il Miglior Fabro, The Better Craftsman, which was Dante's tribute to one of his predecessors. To me, it's a sign of Pound's genius that he saw the formal possibilities in Eliot's very loose sequence. Under Pound's hand, the Wasteland was transformed from a series of narrative and dramatic episodes into a kind of cinematographic montage of images and incidents that is unified by a presiding sensibility. Whether we look at Pound's large structural changes or at his works on the details of language, we see the practical result of his long struggle to forge a modern idiom. The tendency before the publication of the Wasteland Manuscript in 1971 was to read that poem as a magisterial critique of modern culture. More recently, with new evidence, especially biographical evidence before us, critics and readers have emphasized the poem's personal and lyric qualities. Both readings, I think, are valid and reinforce each other. We might even say that the Wasteland began as a personal confession and ended as a text for its time. Earlier critics, influenced by Eliot's comments on the mythic method in Ulysses, stressed the importance of the Grail legend as a controlling point of reference. I think many readers today would find Eliot's exact use of the social details and the topography of London just as important because it enables him to intensify the power of the hallucinatory scenes in the poem by placing them against a familiar landscape. Reacting against the initial cry that Eliot was a kind of poetic anarchist who had destroyed the tradition, Eliot's first defenders may have overstressed the order and the patterning of the wasteland, its mythic unity, while neglecting the distinctive voice that holds it together. When Virginia Woolf heard Eliot read the poem aloud in late 1922, Virginia Woolf said that she had not yet tackled the sense. I have only the sound of it in my ears, but I like the sound. Anyone who has heard Eliot's masterful reading of the poem will know really that all the variations in tone and voice come from a single personality. One aspect of the wasteland, which I think should be noted as a basis for comparison with Eliot's later poems, especially for, for quartets, <clears throat> 
is the precise nature of the allusions, symbolized by Eliot's own infamous notes to the poem. When the speaker at the end of part one of the wasteland watches the anonymous commuters moving across London Bridge toward the city of London, he says, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge so many, I had not thought death had it undone so many. Now here Eliot, as his note indicates, expects the reader to recognize that third line, I had not thought death had undone so many, as coming from Dante's Inferno, it's Dante's commentary on those in limbo. So as in the quatrain poems, the reader of the wasteland has to understand Eliot's particular use of the past in order to grasp his attitude toward the present. And part of the deliberate difficulty of this new poetry as practiced by Pound and Eliot was this method which coerces the reader who has been captured by the music of the poetry into exploring the origins of the poetry in the literary tradition. In a very real sense, the early poems of Eliot and of Pound were written to enforce their critical ideas. The Wasteland appeared in October 1922 in the first issue of The Criterion, an influential literary journal that Eliot edited in the years between the wars. I think the preeminence of The Criterion in the 20s and 30s was a reflection of Eliot's own dominance in the literary world. By the time he wrote the last three quartets in the early 1940s, he could speak with the authority of an unofficial poet laureate of two nations. Yet this fame did very little to assuage the anxieties that are evident in the wasteland. And we find those anxieties intensified in its successor, The Hollow Men of 1925. In The Hollow Men, we have Eliot's bleakest description of the modern wasteland, unrelieved by the rich music and the humor of the earlier poems. The Hollow Men is the dead center of his career, after which there could come only silence are a turning towards something new. That turning, our conversion, and after all turning is the old fashioned word for conversion, that turning took place in 1927. In 1927, Eliot announced that he was a classicist in literature, a royalist in politics, and an Anglo-Catholic in religion. At that time, those who had taken Eliot as a spokesman for the lost generation were astounded but I think from our point of view, any close reading of his early life and art makes that decision seem inevitable. And the poetic effects of Eliot's conversion in 1927, this turning, were immediately evident in the first of the aerial poems, Journey of the Magi. The entire poem, Journey of the Magi, is written in a sustained narrative form that contrasts sharply with the nervous pastiche quality of the wasteland itself. Even the use of allusion is different. In Garantian, that prelude to the wasteland, Eliot adapted this mysterious passage from a 17th century Christmas sermon. The word within a word, unable to speak a word, swaddled with darkness. In Journey of the Magi, Eliot opens with a quotation from the same sermon, but the tone is quite different. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. Here the strong narrative line reflects a new confidence, if not a new serenity. Eliot's conversion led him to write in 1927-30, the most private of his poems, Ash Wednesday, where the opening line, because I do not hope to turn again, announces his subject. The poem is filled with imagery from the Christian tradition and allusions to the Anglo-Catholic Catholic liturgy. Ash Wednesday is a poem that assumes a sympathetic and a Christian audience. Now in 1932, after an absence of nearly 20 years, Eliot returned to America, and the experience had a profound effect on his poetry. Like Spencer Bryden in Henry James's short story, The Jolly Corner, Eliot had spent his adult life in Europe after Strange Gods. And he must have been aware, to quote from his play, The Family Reunion, that the man who returns will have to meet the boy who left. Eliot spent most of that year, 
in America at Harvard, where he gave the Charles Eliot Norton lectures, later published as The Use of Poetry and The Use of Criticism. In these lectures, as in much of Eliot's criticism written after 1927, the form of his early essays has given way to a more loose and discursive style. The early essays were primarily literary in focus, and like the early poetry, they were organized around elusive touchstone quotations. Now that kind of method was obviously unsuited for the public lectures that Eliot was asked to give as his fame increased. But the change in method that you see in the Harvard lectures also resulted, I think, from a desire to discuss broader cultural and broader religious issues to define a tradition that was not solely a literary tradition. Eliot's Harvard lectures were rather cautious and academic in tone, as befitted the occasion. But in the spring of 1933, he journeyed south to the University of Virginia, and in the congenial and conservative atmosphere of Charlottesville, he spoke, spoke much more openly about his personal convictions. The most interesting thing about After Strange Gods, the title of the Charlottesville lectures, is not the social ideas, but the sense of landscape that pervades the book. In his early poetry of urban life, Eliot had suppressed his deep feeling for nature. But in 1932-33, his return to the American scenes of his youth led to both a quickening of his poetic transformation and to a kind of rapprochement, an accommodation with the American inheritance, an accommodation with the American inheritance that is vital to four quartets. The man who gave the Harvard lectures thought his poetic life was behind him. His last words were, the sad ghost of Coleridge beckons from the shadows. But soon he was writing landscape poems such as Virginia and New Hampshire that prepared the way for four quartets. Let's briefly look at New Hampshire. Children's voices in the orchard between the blossom and the fruit time, golden head, crimson head, between the green tip and the root, black wing, brown wing, hover over 20 years and the spring is over. Here in New Hampshire, the tone is elegiac, but the new music, the new liberation of sound, speaks of a liberated imagination. Now, Bernd Norton, the first of the quartets, was written in 1935. The setting is an English country house that Eliot visited, as he said, without knowing anything whatsoever about the history of the house or who had lived in it, and where he underwent the intense emotional experience of landscape as a state of feeling, a prompt from memory that motivates the entire poem. The theme of Bert Norton is the difficulty of reconciling the timeless with that which lives and dies in time. And the poem is filled with spots of time, as Wordsworth called them, or epiphanies, as Joyce might have said, that offer intimations of what might be accomplished. Bert Norton is religious in tone, but not specifically Christian in content. It stands in the great tradition of English landscape poetry. In writing Bert Norton, Eliot followed the pattern he and Pound had devised for the wasteland, five sections like a five-act play, with the fourth section a condensed lyric that turns the poem. It's important to understand that when Eliot wrote Burt Norton, he did not have a sequence in mind. He had just finished Murder in the Cathedral, a stylized religious drama, which does rehearse some of the major themes of the quartets. And he went on to write after Burt Norton his finest play, The Family Reunion, where, like Yeats, he tries to revive the traditions of popular verse drama. Near the end of his life, Eliot said that if there hadn't been a war, I would probably have tried to write another play. It was the dislocations of wartime London and the threat to his two cultures, one native, one adopted, that drove Eliot toward the last three quartets. East Coker of 1940, set in the English village of Eliot's ancestors, is a meditation on the personal and historical past. Very like the family reunion, it's a Jamesian drama of both what was and what might have been, and it contains some of Eliot's most personal poetry as in the opening of part five. So here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years, 
20 years largely wasted trying to learn to use words, and every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure. Uh, this passage, which ends, for us there is only the trying, the rest is not our business, is paralleled by the personal statements that open part five of each of the quartets. And it's this symmetry of the four quartets that's both the great strength and one of the weaknesses of that poem. Beginning with the second, East Coker, Eliot had to replicate the pattern of Burnt Norton. He had to do that in every succeeding quartet, so the entire work can be read either as a four-part sequence as a, or as a four-ply, lap-over-lap, single poem. The strain placed on Eliot by this need to follow a set pattern of themes and verse structures is most evident in The Dry Salvages of 1941. And this is the poem most readers find least satisfying, although the first movements, I think, rank with the finest poetry that Eliot ever wrote. The Dry Salvages, as Eliot tells us, is a small group of rocks with a beacon off the northeast coast of Cape Ann, Massachusetts. And this is Eliot's most American poem, in which he recalls some of his childhood and youth. Whereas East Coker is concerned with historical time, the Dry Salvages examines all the orders of time under the aspect of the timeless incarnation. And it prepares us for the more explicitly Christian poetry of the last of the quartets, Little Gidding. It's almost as if in The Dry Salvages, Eliot were conducting his reader through a series of more and more specialized initiations, leading from a secular vision to the Christian epiphanies of Little Gidding. Little Gidding, the setting of the last of the quartets, is a sacred place. It's the site of a 17th century community that was devoted to the religious life. And Eliot uses the associations hovering about the place to really draw together the four quartets. Many readers feel that the closure is a forced one, accomplished more through imagery and music than through the argument of the poem. Lacking Dante's unified culture, lacking the kind of sympathetic audience of earlier Christian poets, all Eliot can do is present the hints and guesses, as he calls them, that have moved him to belief. But if the final section of Little Gidding is somewhat anticlimactic, it's a closure more in music than in intellectual thought, the brilliant imitation of Dante in part two is really the crown of Eliot's poetic achievement. In this passage, a lifetime devoted to the study of Dante and the poetic tradition is justified. The scene is one familiar to all readers of Eliot, an encounter with an alter ego, another self, a double, a familiar compound ghost, as Eliot calls him, both intimate and unidentifiable. It resembles the encounter with Stetson at the end of part one of The Wasteland, but here the literary allusions, and there are many of them, have been really subsumed into the narrative, doing their work from well below the surface. At the close of this great passage, Eliot's favorite image from Dante, the willing acceptance of the refining fire of purgatory, is combined with William Butler Yeats's favorite image of wholeness, the dancer and the dance. From wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds unless restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure like a dancer. In the 20 years after the Second World War, Eliot wrote a number of important critical essays and three popular plays, The Cocktail Party, The Confidential Clark, and The Elder Statesman. But he never returned to lyric poetry after four quartets, and it seems fair to say that his great and lasting influence will rest on the work of his years between the wars, especially The Wasteland, and four quartets.